Amen. Thank you, Carolyn. I don't know if you ever thought about it, but uh, the, the way that I have kind of an un, unusual way of preparing for a lesson, and what I do is for weeks, I just cram all the knowledge I can get into my head and just keep stuffing it in there and stuffing it in there, and then when it comes time to teach, I just pull the cork at the bottom and let it, let it all run out. Well, the problem is on a day like today when I get the call late to come and preach that some of the sermon might run out. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> it's, and I'm using some of the same uh, scripture verses, so you, you guys just uh, bear with me on that point, if you will. Uh, but it's, it's been a very exciting day, and uh, uh, it's been exciting uh, since Jordan called me, because uh, last week, uh, it, it was kind of funny, we exchanged some emails, and um, I told Jordan that I was praying that the baby came soon, like Monday. <laughs> and... And he texted me back a, a note that uh, said that uh, Caitlin was not amused. And so I know that last night she was just jumping up and down and doing everything she could. So uh, anyway, put on your track shoes today, if you would, because we're going to be discussing um, Genesis 48, 49, and 50. I don't like covering that much ground, and I'm not going to be able to read every word of it, as is typically my custom. Uh, but I want you to to get it all at the same time because it's one lesson uh, and you know I would be doing you short shrift if I broke it up so kind of bear with me if you will. I, I want to introduce it in a kind of an interesting way though out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I used part of that in my message this morning but I think every Christian, every believer ought to be intimately familiar with your role in, in the body of Christ. Uh, and in, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, it talks about the fact that God has placed us here. God has placed us. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. So I want you to think about that. God placed you here and, and, and gifted you for a very special reason. So I would ask you to spend some time pondering what that is and what I need to do to fulfill my purpose. Uh, that's going to be the point of the lesson today. So kind of follow along with me as, as we you know, walk alongside uh, Jacob, uh, Israel, uh, and his family, particularly Joseph, who has been the central character for several weeks now. Now... Uh, if you'll recall the story of Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers, rose to prominence, uh, then what we have is uh, through a series of just incredible events, the brothers end up coming down to Egypt to look for food. Uh, Joseph recognizes them, and eventually they are reconciled and reunited, and they have even brought dad down. They've gone back and brought uh, Jacob down with all his family. Starting in chapter 48, some time later, Joseph was told, your father is ill. So he took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, along with him. When Jacob was told, your son Joseph has come to you, Israel rallied his strength and sat up on the bed. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I'm going to make you, faithful, make you fruitful and will increase your numbers. I will make you a community of peoples, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. Now then, your two sons bought, born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours, and the territory they inherit will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. An odd thing to say. I don't know if, if you thought about this, but, but you know, Israel, Jacob, had 12 sons. His favorite was Joseph. He thought he'd lost him. He didn't. He was reunited with him. And so now as he comes back to, to see him, he finds out to his surprise, not only does he have his long lost son, but his son had two sons of his own, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so when he calls them in, he's on his deathbed, he is ready to bless his sons, to give his blessing. This was kind of a, a, a traditional thing, uh, that he would bless them and, and pronounce the blessing and divide the inheritance and that type of thing. But he said an odd thing, he said, okay, Joseph, uh, not only will you be one of my sons, 
but your sons will be counted among my sons. And then he specifically said, if you have other sons, they won't be. They will still be as a member of whatever tribe that they're born to, but they will not be reckoned as my sons. So he singled out Ephraim and Manasseh. So if you will, turn on over to chapter 49. Because as we get near the end of, uh, of Jacob's life, I want to spend some time here because uh, it's, it's not just a history lesson, but it's fascinating to know how the words that God gives Jacob on his deathbed are going to play out over the centuries. Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather around so that I can tell you what will happen to you in days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to your father Israel. Now he's going to address them, and he's going to address them by age. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. That's the pluses. Then he says, turbulent as the waters, you will no longer excel, for you went up to your father's bed onto my couch and defiled it. I don't know if you remember the story, but we talk, talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago that while, uh, while uh, Jacob was out of town, he, while he was away, Reuben actually went into Jacob's concubine, who would have been his stepmother, uh, and had sexual relations with her. Uh, a thing that God was not happy about at all, and as you can imagine, Jacob was not happy about. And so he said, okay, you're my firstborn. Uh, you will be a powerful man. Your tribe will be a powerful clan. But let me tell you this, you will, because of your turbulent nature, you will no longer excel because of this sin. Now listen, as the firstborn son, Reuben should have received a double portion of the inheritance. Here's how they did it. Uh, if, if he had 12 sons, normally they would have divided his estate into 13 parts, and Reuben, as the eldest, would have received two. In addition, he would have been the priest of the family. That's something you probably didn't know. They didn't have the ordained priesthood then. He would have been the priest of the family, and he would have been the titular head. Uh, he would have been the, the acknowledged head of the family. None of that's going to happen because of his sin. Uh, as a result, he got none uh, as a result of his sexual relationship with his father's concubine. And because of that, the tribe of Reuben would be relegated to a minor role in Israel's history. And if you read forward in Judges and uh, uh, Chronicles, for example, you will find out that no judge, king, or prophet ever came from the tribe of Reuben. So they were kind of relegated to the dustbin of history. The next two, and these were lumped in together, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their swords are weapons of violence. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger and hamstrung oxen as they pleased. Cursed be their anger, so fierce, their fury so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel." I don't remember if you recall, but Simeon and Levi were the two brothers who avenged the rape of their sister Dinah by the murder of an entire tribe of people called the Shechemites. Uh, and so, and if you'll recall, dur during that, not only did they slaughter all the people in the village, but they slaughtered all the livestock. So, hence the fact that it mentions here that they were murderers and that they hamstrung the oxen. He said, because of that, because of that very violent act, you're not going to own a part of my estate. Neither tribe was going to be given a lasting homeland. Now, if you go back in the, you know, the last book in your Bible, the one called books, called maps back there, uh, you'll see a map of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they got a homeland, both, both uh, Simeon and, excuse me, Simeon got a homeland when they went in, but it was soon absorbed into the tribe of Judah, and later on in Israel's history, there was no tribe of Simeon. The Levites, however, were a little bit more blessed because the Levites became the priestly tribe. Moses and Aaron, for example, were, were from that tribe. But they never got a homeland. Uh, they, they were given portions from the other, the other brothers' areas, from the other tribes, but they did not have a homeland. So Simeon and Levi, because of their violent actions, never got a homeland in the, in the, uh, in the promised land. Now, Judah, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. 
You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. Let me stop right there for just a moment. Amidst all those superlatives and the visuals that you get uh, from, from that particular period in time in history, uh, sometimes it's easy for us to miss as 21st century Americans. But look what he tells them. What's, what's the most powerful regal animal he could think of? A lion. So he says, okay, Judah, you are going to be, and you've heard today the phrase, the lion of Judah. Okay, you, so he's, he's saying, okay, your, your clan, your, your tribe will be the most powerful. The scepter will not depart. Who holds the scepter? The king. The king holds the scepter. So he says the rulers, uh, will, will, not just the rulers, but the ruler will come from you. And then look what he says. The ruler's staff shall not, shall not re return from his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come. Who would that be? The Messiah. Okay, so what he's prophesying here is not only will kings such as David and, and Solomon, for example, come from the tribe of Judah, uh, but also the king of kings, Jesus, the Messiah himself. And then he, he talks about the Messiah when he says a very interesting description. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. All visuals that we have a hard time getting, but here's the picture. He's going to be royalty of royalty. Who else could afford to wash their garments in wine? Uh, the purple being the royal color, of course. Uh, and he, he talks about his, his description that his eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. He's talking about a beautiful person here. Uh, you want a beautiful description? Read in, in Revelation 19 the, the description of Jesus coming again. Uh, it is awesome, uh, and it goes right along with this. All right, here's the side notes. Judah assumed the role of the leader of the nation. Uh, his tribe would indeed become the greatest, and, and the kingly line, which as I've already mentioned, uh, not all the kings, but the kingly line that's generally thought of as being greatest in Israel, uh, you know, David, Solomon, uh, would come from Judah, as would the Messiah. Now it kind of gets a little more interesting. Zebulun will live by the seashore and become a haven for ships. His border will extend towards Sidon. Zebulun was the mystery tribe. Uh, we learn little of his character uh, in the previous chapters of Genesis. We learn nothing of his character here, only where it says he's going to live, and that's incorrect. Uh, if you look at the, the geographical lo location for the tribe of Zebulun, it's not by the seashore. It's about 10 miles inland, and there are other tribes, as a matter of fact, between them and the seashore. So we have, listen, I have heard uh, intellects and pseudo-intellects pontificate for hours on this subject about what it really meant when he said this, and you know what? Nobody knows. I don't care what they say. They don't know. So, so you can read the commentaries, whatever you read, but it is all eisegesis. In other words, they've read something into Scripture that is not there because Scripture and indeed history tells us nothing about the tribe of Zebulun other than the fact that they were located in a really small pocket about 10 miles from the coast. Issachar is a raw-boned donkey lying among the sheep pens. How would you like your daddy to describe you like that? Here are raw-boned donkey. Uh, where else have we heard that same kind of phrase used before? How about Abraham's first son? I think when he said he will be a wild donkey of a man. Okay. Stop and think about that. So it, it, it means someone who's going to be living in the wild, someone who's strong, and someone who's strong-willed. When he sees how good is his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to the burden and submit to forced labor. Let me tell you just straight out, submit to forced labor is a really bad translation because what do you think that means? Servitude or slavery, that's not what it means at all. It means he's going to be a, a hard-working farmer. 
That's what it means. That's the best, that's the best translation of the Hebrew. So what it says is that he's going to be between two sheep pens. Uh, it's not a physical description of Issachar. Uh, he had a relatively small area, and it's located in an interesting place. The tribe of Manasseh eventually split into two half-tribes, and the, the tribe of Issachar was nestled right in the middle of it. So when it says it's surrounded by two sheep pens, he's just saying you're going to be, be kind of engulfed by a larger tribe. But they did lead a very quiet uh, but strong existence, and they were agrarian in nature. Dan will provide justice for his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan will be a snake by the roadside, a viper along the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider tumbles backward. That's a kind of an interesting description. The first one to look at is that Dan provides justice for his people. Uh, from the tribe of Dan came one of the best known of the judges that we'll read about in the book of Judges. His name is Samson. I don't know if you've heard about him before. He was a great warrior. The tribe were great warriors. Um, the tribe, uh, though, was described as a viper because as we find out later in history, uh, when you read in the Chronicles, that they actually induced the other northern tribes around them into pagan worship. So the legacy, and it's amazing that you know, God reveals this to Jacob even here, but he says, you know what, you're going to be a viper along the path. And lead the other tribes uh, in your region into, into pagan worship. Then he, then he stops for a moment and he says, I look for your deliverance, Lord. He continues with Gad. Gad will be attacked by a band of raiders, but he will attack them at their heels. Gad's kind of an interesting story because when if you kind of get a picture of the... Um, the, the Jordan River, and I guess I'm going to do it like you would look at it. Over here on the east, they, they were approaching the, the promised land from the east. And when they crossed over into the promised land, the, the tribes were given territory over here. Gad didn't. Gad settled on the east side of the Jordan River, which was not exactly the place that God had as their promised land. The biggest problem with that is when the neighboring countries, the tribes, the kingdoms, as they grew stronger, when they invaded the promised land, they went right through Gad to do it. So that's why it said he will be attacked by a band of raiders. But Gad was actually kind of a good watchdog for the, for the rest of the tribes because quite often they bore the brunt of the attacks and, and quite frequently, uh, with God by their side, repelled them. Asher. Asher's food will be rich. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. This is the second part to the mystery of Zebulun. Uh, remember where, where he prophesied that Zebulun would, would live by the seashore? He didn't. Asher did. Asher's tribe was on the seashore, uh, and so they had the advantage of the most fertile farmland in all of the, the Holy Land, plus they had the advantage of having a seaport city of, of Tyre. So you can see why their food was rich and they provided delicacies for the king. They had the best uh, farmland and they had the advantage of the best trade opportunity. And, and indeed, the tribe of Asher eventually got known for growing rich on trade. Naphtali. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Anybody knows what that means? Me neither. A complete mystery. And this is funny because this is one where even the commentaries just kind of go, well, okay, uh, not only, and, and skip on by because no one really has a clue. Little is known about Naphtali in, in, in Genesis. We don't know of him in history. Uh, any, uh, any, his, his role in the history of the nation of Israel uh, is, is minor, is tiny to say the least. Uh, and the interpretation of the meaning of doe and her fawns is pure speculation because no one has a clue. Uh, only posterity will tell, and maybe that's one of those questions you ask when you cross the river one day. Now, however, he's going to really warm up because he's at his favorite son. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. Now, who would the archers be, by the way? His own brothers. That's what he's talking about here. His own brothers attacked him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber. 
because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, that's, that's, he's not talking of himself, he's talking about his God, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb. Your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. I want you to stop and think and put yourself in Jacob's place. Who's his favorite son, obviously? Joseph is. I mean, he gave him the coat for crying out loud. You know, this, this was his, the son on whom he just fawned. But here's what's interesting is there's an indication that even when he is giving these blessings, when God, the Holy Spirit, is giving him these blessings, he doesn't know at this time that the preeminent among all his sons is going to be Judah and not Joseph. Because he's pronouncing the greatest blessings on Joseph. Here's why I know. Remember I told you that the double portion that should have gone to Reuben at the first, to whom is he giving it? Essentially to Joseph, because he's giving full portions to Manasseh and Ephraim, to both of the grandsons. So, and I, the indication is that Jacob really expects that the greatest glory, honor now and in the future is going to go to Joseph. But God had a different plan. God had a little different plan. What's interesting is that the, uh, uh, the tribe, uh, in the time of Exodus, the tribe of Ephraim, uh, actually provided the leadership because Joshua uh, was, was a member of the tribe of Ephraim. And many of the early leaders in the, during the Exodus actually were from the tribe of Ephraim. And the tribe of Manasseh was the largest, if you look at the territory in, in the, the promised land, was actually divided into two half tribes. So early on, they were the blessed tribes. But as God's plan unfolded, the tribe of Judah became prominent. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he devours the prey, in the evening he divides the plunder. The tribe of Benjamin uh, would be one of the smallest in history of, of Israel, but would produce uh, great warriors. Uh, do you remember the, the best known one? This is a trivia question. Who was the first king of Israel? Saul was a Benjaminite, was a great warrior. Uh, what's kind of sad, though, is at one time the tribe of Benjamin actually went to war against the rest of the tribes. There was a civil war uh, and actually held their own. So they were known as great warriors even when they divided up and, uh, and fought against, uh, against the other tribes. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. Then he gave them these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave of the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial place from Ephraim the Hittite. If you remember, Abraham uh, and, and Sarah were buried there also. So um, Isaac also. So now Jacob says, I want you to bury me there. Abraham and wife Sarah were buried there. Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people, uh, which means simply that, that he went into the arms of the Lord. He died at that time. Now, look at chapter 50. I want to take just a moment. I don't want to skip that. But I want to cover just a couple of things in chapter 50. Joseph threw himself on his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. That was something, by the way, that the Jews didn't do at that time. That was distinctly Egyptian. Um, so the physicians embalmed him, taking the full 40 days, and that was the time required for embalming. And the Egyptians mourned him for 70 days. Then the days of mourning had passed, Joseph said to Pharaoh's court, If I have found favor in your eyes, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him my father made me swear an oath and say, I'm about to die. Bury me in the tomb I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Now let me go up and bury my father, then I will return. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear to do. So he did it. So Joseph 
took a, a pretty good company of people, went up and buried his father back into Canaan. Now, I want you to just stop and put yourself in the place of his brothers. Joseph returns to Egypt as one of the most powerful men in the entire country. What are his brothers thinking at this time? Oh, man, he was nice enough to us while daddy was alive, but daddy's gone now. Is this when he gets, when he gets his revenge? When Joseph, look at verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. I, I love that. I love that. Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you were to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Pants on fire. Man, talk about doing a little scrambling. They inherited the old dishonesty gene from their dad, let me tell you. But uh, they said, look, dad said before he died, you weren't supposed to you know, take any, any revenge on us. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Now, we're going to kind of tie things up rather quickly uh, with Joseph's death. And then it says he stayed with his family until he was 110 years old. Uh, which was, you know, not nearly the longevity as his father or his grandfather. But he saw his, his grandchildren grow up. And then when he was about to die, he said to his brothers, I'm about to die. God will come to your aid and take you up and out of this land. He promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid and you must carry my bones up from this place. So he died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So it's kind of interesting. He was, he was the second youngest son, and yet when he died, he made his brothers promise that they, would, that they would take him out of Egypt. And he promised them this. He says, you know what? God brought you down here, but he's going to take you back to the promised land. He didn't tell them it was going to be another 400 years. But he said, you're going you're gonna to go back to the promised land, and when you go... Take my bones with you. He didn't ask to be buried now, but he wanted his bones to be taken later. And as we're going to discover later, at the time of the Exodus, they carried along a box with Joseph's bones in it. Uh, speaking of which, we are going to be, be doing Exodus next. I could not stop in Genesis. We're going to do Exodus and then move into the New Testament after that. But let me tell you what the lesson for today is. The family of Jacob was made up of 12 sons each with a completely different personality, each with completely different gifts. Uh, does that sound familiar? Anybody here got multiple children? Are they just alike? Like we've got two sons who are from different planets. <laughs> different planets. Love them both. They're completely different people with completely different gifts. Isn't it amazing how God puts his people together? Isn't it amazing how God works his church? Um, how, first, how boring would it be if we, we were all just the little cookie cutter people? And the fact that God is able to blend such a tapestry of giftedness, orneriness sometimes, uh, but different people to his purpose. The nation of Israel was composed of 12 tribes. Uh, and some people have really struggled with that. Wait a minute, there were 12 sons, but then he had Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, let, me, let me tell you how that works. There were 12 sons, but he, he, he took out uh, the Levites because they didn't have a tribe in the homeland. Uh, and so instead of Joseph, he used his two sons. So you subtract two and add two, and you still got 12 tribes, although they're not the 12, 12 biologic sons of Jacob. Okay, But he, the, God took all those... And, and each one of them a diverse entity. You read the descriptions here. You had everything from a raw-boned donkey, you know, uh, to, to someone who lived richly by the seashore. But he wove all that together uh, into the nation of Israel. 
Crestview Baptist Church is populated by a couple of thousand unique individuals, each with their own spiritual gifts. And I highly suspect we have at least one raw bone donkey in the congregation. <laughs> I'm not looking at the back row, you understand, but, <clears throat> but he knows who he is, you know. And, and stop and think, isn't it amazing how God placed you here? And I look at the story, and I know, it, it, you know, you take the whole long narrative of Joseph and his brothers and the narrative of, 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 of Genesis, and it doesn't distill down to this point, but the story of Joseph does, and, and Jacob's sons, because God took a, a, a disparate group, a, a diverse group, uh, a group of people, all of whom were sinners, uh, some by man's reckoning better than others, uh, but made an, his nation, his chosen people, uh, the ones whom he promised would be as numerous as stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore, uh, used such odd, odd raw material to make his people. Can't he do the same thing with his church? Yes, he can. Uh, I visited hundreds of homes over the years with Kay. We, she's been my visitation partner for years, and one of the things she's heard me say till she's tired of it is, is we don't recruit here. God's got a place for you. If it's not here, how silly would I be to try to convince you to come to Crestview because I like it or because I'm here or because we think it's the best church? No. God's got a place for you. If it's not here, good. Go to your place. Fit in. Be woven in. Be a part. Be used. And so if I, if I have to look at what constitutes the church, it's a collection of highly flawed people that God uses in a miraculous way to accomplish his purpose, just like he did the nation of Israel. And you know all the yucky stuff we read in Genesis about the, the moral sins and the murders and all this kind of stuff? These were the people God used. Where did you get a load of David? Wow. I don't know about you, but that gives me great hope. It really does. I mean, he used them, then there's a chance for me. You know, he can use me to his purpose. What do we have to do, however, for that to happen? We have to be willing to be used. Now, he's going to accomplish his purpose with or without us. Wouldn't it be nice for it to be with us? Remember our hymn last week? All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Father, for the incredible promise that through the gift of grace, through your Son, Jesus Christ, sacrifice that we can be used, flawed instruments though we be. Just like the family of the patriarch Jacob, you take a ragtag group of people and weave them together into a beautiful tapestry. And I thank you, Father, for that gift. I thank you for these people who come. What a blessing they are. And I pray, Father, that any time that, that your word is read, Father, that it flower in their lives. And as we leave this place today, we be people sharing Jesus, for we do it in your name. Amen. Please find someone that you don't know and say hello to them. <laughs>